success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to grow with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, you Roach with listeners. Today I have uh, Mason McDonald. It's kind of, I think, you, I'm pretty sure you're the third land investor that I've had on the platform. And I'm pretty sure you know the other two. I, I have to look to find the exact names, but I, it's, just, it's a small world. I feel like I'm getting more and more into, into land investing. So thank you, Mason, for being here today. Yeah, super, super happy to be here. And I'm sure I do know all of them. Uh, it's a small world, but it's growing constantly because people see what the opportunity is. What do you so what would your guesstimation, right, of um, land investors in the US? Like what, what would that number look like? Over yeah, and I, I think it's challenging, but speaking specifically to the land flipper, uh, yeah. for people that are buying land for cheap and just selling it for more, I'm sure there's a few thousand, uh, which is not a ton compared to how many single family wholesalers and investors and that sort of thing uh, are out there. But that being said, it's Pareto principle. There's 20% of us doing 80% of the deals of uh, a lot of people will do one deal and never do it again sort of thing. Wait, I, I've always heard of the 80-20. What, what did you call it? It was a what, what principle? Pareto. Pareto. Okay. Well, yeah. Curious. Do you, do you know the, the, the meaning behind Pareto? Oh, God. I'd have to look it up to be <laughs> no, uh, I was completely just saying, accurate. I use that all the time, 20-80, but I never, I never use Pareto principle. I was like, oh. Yeah. I, I say that now I'm like, hmm, how confident am I in this? Uh, so uh, I'm sure someone listening will either verify it or tell me I'm wrong, which uh, please do if I am, if I've been using this wrong all these years. Yeah, no, but if you're like, it's one of those things probably, right? If you're confident enough, usually people won't call you on it. It might be something that would just pass by and people would, oh, someone else might use it too, right? It's like, oh, Pareto principle, you don't know that? Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> and, and someone's going to humble, humble us all or we're all just uh, so smart and right all the time. Yeah. Uh, so walk us through a little bit. I mean, for people that haven't listened to some of the other ones um, about, I guess, land investors, land flippers or, or whatnot, what does it look like with yourself and your company, your team? Yeah. So for my main active business, um, it is I buy land for cheap and I sell it for more. And whenever I am looking at any piece of land, I'm looking at what the best exit strategy is. So Sometimes it is to just buy and sell it. Uh, sometimes it's to find a buyer on the back end and do a double close. Sometimes it's some sort of value add, maybe doing a small entitlement deal or a minor subdivision or a major subdivision or uh, passing it off to a realtor. Um, but that's kind of the bread and butter. It's a direct seller marketing business where we acquire land at a discount and then dispose, dispose of it in, uh, or dispose of it <laughs> at uh, a higher, higher amount. I man again. I'm I, I'm gonna look this up afterwards. Who who the last one I had on here about the land? But I think they. Were, I remember them talking about it, or maybe I saw one of their videos like that because I, I usually follow people that I've had on the podcast, and sometimes the content I just kind of start hearing it. And it was like have a set number. It doesn't matter what the land is. Have a set number of I think I don't know if it was five hundred or five thousand, but throw that out as your first thing because usually most people don't even know what land is worth. Yeah, and it, it really depends on the type of land that you're going after, where I typically target infill lots or land that's already horizontally developed, shovel ready to build on. I look at buildable land. I know a lot of people in the space are in the recreational, uh, on the recreational side of things. I've done a, hand, a couple dozen rec deals, but uh, they tend to sit longer. Uh, the margins are better, but it takes longer to sell as versus the infill lots. The margins aren't as good, but they sell a lot quicker. So there's strategy there and it really depends on the avatar that you're dealing with of a lot of people that I work with are not necessarily distressed sellers that would take $500 for their land. They'll sell it at a discount for the convenient side of things, but those sellers are the former developers or former investors, or they inherited it from a family member that they understand the value of the land, but they do business with me because then they don't have to deal with the realtor and signing all the paperwork. It's a super simple, easy, convenient process that we can offer. Well, I mean, the I think there's a difference from the value of the land, I guess, relative to them, relative to what it probably would would, would go for, right? I mean, like, like I, even though it's been proven that the Zillow's estimate is pretty off in some some uh, some occasions, if uh, there's been a lot of variances in the community, 
And I would think it'd be even more so when it comes to Lamb, and it's really hard for her to come up with a number. Absolutely. So it, and it depends on how many transactions there are occurring in a very specific subdivision and how you value it. Where with land, whenever you're doing a comparable analysis, there's so many factors that determine what the value of the land is. And unless you're in the business and you understand the zoning and where utility lines stop and start, it, it's very difficult of the land that's on the same street where uh, I just sold a piece of land. Worst, worst deal technically that I've ever done. It took a year to sell. I made like a 30% return on my investment, but over a year is not great in the land space. Um, but I bought it and the water line stops right before that lot. It was a failure on my part to not verify that during my due diligence period. But uh, if there was a water line, if the water line extended, the land was worth about thirty-five or forty thousand dollars. I sold it for eighty-five hundred bucks. Um, granted, I bought it for all in like four grand, but it's uh, it's figuring out all those little nuances during your due diligence process to make sure that the comps where you're looking at the sold data that they match up directly with what the product is that you're purchasing. Do you in that in that space for the seller? Do you, are they usually coming up with the number like arbitrary, arbitrary, or is there something that they usually? Oh, a friend did this, or because again, it's hard probably for them to find true information of what that probably land is worth. Oh yeah, so I mean, there there there's a number of ways that you'll you'll hear the seller say certain numbers of. Okay, well, the land assessed for this amount, which sometimes means something, depending on which county that you're operating in, what the assessor or treasurer's office comes out with. Or they have a buddy that's a realtor that says they could sell it for this much. Or they looked themselves on Zillow or Redfin and they see what is selling for this amount. Or they have a number in mind because they have, for the more distressed sellers, of they've got a $10,000 medical bill or something they need to pay. So they need $10,000 cash for their land. They want to move it in a week or two. Uh, a lot of the times it's arbitrary. And it, in my mind, it doesn't matter too much where I look at the margins in my business and say, okay, well, I know that this land's going to sell for $100,000. It's going to take probably two to three months to sell. And I know it's going to sell because there's so many verifiable transactions that are occurring. I feel comfortable offering $67,500 um, because my cost of capital is this much that my operating expense is this much. And then my desired return after everything is this much. So it all depends on the individual property. And once you do enough transactions, you really start to dial in what your numbers need to be on each piece of land. Well, let's rewind. I mean, so who was young Mason? Was he all about, um, I mean, getting into the, to the land flipping, real estate flipping, just kind of find ways to make money. Who was young Mason? Yeah. Young Mason was, uh, too smart for his own good. Um, so I, I wanted to be a physician growing up, uh, because I thought that was the most prestigious and most intelligent thing I could do. That's what I went to college for. Uh, I got my degree in neuroscience at Baylor university, did the pre-med route senior year. I realized I hated science. I mean, I took the MCAT, got med school interviews and everything. And just um, couldn't do it. So wanted to figure out what to do next. And business was interesting to me. And my research supervisor told me, what about healthcare administration? Uh, didn't know what that was. Didn't realize hospitals needed administrators. Uh, so figured that out five days before graduating, got accepted to a master's program, did my master's degree, and then started my career in healthcare administration. Uh, worked my way up to CEO of a hospital here in Colorado Springs at 26 years old, um, made it to the top, hated my life. I was making great money. I was also hypertensive stage two. I was never home. I was working a hundred hours a week and I heard about land flipping. Always wanted to be a real estate investor. My family had been in real estate, so I knew it was the path that I wanted to take. But it was one of those moments where this uh, land flipping coach, Brent Bowers, who's a good friend of mine and a business partner of mine, uh, told me what he was doing. And it was like that moment in the Wolf of Wall Street where Jonah Hill was like, show me your paycheck and I'll quit my job. And so, yeah, I took Brent's course and um, that was November of 2021. And I did a land flip uh, that year and made like 115 grand on my first flip and quit my job. And here I am. So uh, I'm so for everyone listening, 
I'm pretty sure I've had Brent on the on the platform. So if if you want to go go back and listen to to Brent too, um, I mean sometimes you start forgetting. I've had like 300, 400 episodes, so, but I'm pretty sure I've had Brent on the platform. So if you want to take a listen and um, hear from uh, Mace's mentor, uh, so interesting. So 26, you take a class, right? You still have the job. What's like? What are the next steps? Because I mean, it's in San Diego. There is a lot like one of the, the trippiest numbers that I always tell people is there's one of the biggest flipping companies makes more money off of their classes than they do on their flips. Right. And so there's so many classes out there. And a lot of, of those people don't actually do the business. Right. They take the class, but they never do anything with it. So what did that look like? You're 26 years old. You take the class. What happens next? Yeah. So um, in the position I was in, like it was it was very different than what a lot of 26 year olds uh job is I was managing a nine figure PL. I had 25 direct reports, few hundred employees, four or 500 employees. And it, it was very, it was very complex, very regulated environment. Healthcare in the United States is the most regulated environment in, in, or industry to me in the entire world. Uh, I mean, we have dozens of regulatory bodies and agencies and reporting to do from Sarbanes-Oxley to the joint commission and CMS and everyone in between. And the the idea and concept of land flipping was so simple to me, which was what was so appealing. So, and I sent out like a thousand letters of direct mail marketing. I think at that point in time, I was doing blind offers. I don't do those anymore. Um, of just purchase agreements in the mail saying, I want to buy your land at one, two, three main street for X amount of dollars. And I sent those in summer of 2021, you know, closed my first deal in November of 2021 on, on some of those letters, didn't know what I was doing. And then yeah, from there, when I recognize the opportunity of before you go to the next one, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's rewind on that one. So a thousand offers you put out there on, on like the RPA, right? So uh, you're talking about what, like twenty pages? No, no, no. I mean, they're like simple. Let's see. I've got like an old one oh, here. One pagers. One page purchase agreement. I want to buy okay. your land. You know, super simple. Okay. And so a thousand. Stand. Yeah. And and how many responses did you get off the thousand? God, at that point in time, I got probably like 10 responses okay. Um, okay. and closed one deal, which was a three lot package. So at that first one, okay, so you get the 10, the 10, right? Now, again, you're taking the jump, right? Taking the jump, right? To go, okay, I got these 10 people reaching out to me. And what allowed you, I guess, to, to make the jump? Did you already go, I got this money stored away that I'm going to use towards this and effort I have to make one purchase or what did that look like? Yeah. So, um, I'm married. My, my wife stable makes six figures as well, uh, in her stable job. And as a hospital CEO, I had a pretty great income coming in. So we'd saved up a little bit of money and it, uh, we took that money and bought those three lots. Um, just knowing that, look, if we invest in single family home, like we're not going to get a, a great return. It's going to be great for tax benefits. It's going to be great for long-term appreciation and everything like that. We we're very comfortable financially. I had no intention of quitting my job. Uh, that was something that happened whenever I made six figures on that first flip. Uh, but it, it definitely was a gamble because I didn't know what I was doing. Despite taking the course, doing a decent amount of research, like until you're actually doing transactions, you're never going to figure out all the nuances that we talked about kind of at the beginning of the show. So in uh, in the grand scheme of things, like would I do that deal that I did then now? Probably not, which is kind of funny of like that was kind of a risky deal in my mind. It, the land wasn't what I typically do. It was kind of like confusing. One piece was landlocked, all this weird, bizarre stuff going on with it. But um, man, I was on vacation and I was looking at the assessor's website of looking at the land all around the three lots I bought. And I saw that one of those lots and I bought three of them. One lot recently sold for 150 for just that one. And I bought those first three for like 44,000 all in. So it was in that moment I realized, oh shoot, I did something right here. Uh, I kind of figured it out. And then whenever I talked to a realtor, we listed it at 200 grand uh, for all three of them. So it wow. it kind of worked out. I definitely got lucky. It was taking action and taking a gamble and taking a risk that made it happen. But it was also um, for us in our financial position, if I had lost that 45,000, um, it wouldn't have been the end of the world for us. So it, that's not me saying like, go out and drop 45 grand on something. We were in a very stable position where we could afford to lose that amount of money. Okay. So at that time, right. And there's always a common theme, right. With 
with entrepreneurs, right? That you either have people go, I'm God's gift to this thing, or the process was really good, or you know what? I just got lucky in this one. The next one's going to actually make or break me. I'm like, so after that first one, who were you after that? Who were you and your wife, I guess? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was pretty exciting. So I, I quit my job before we actually sold it, recognized oh, wow. the value and everything. Okay. And I mean, the job was killing me. Um, I, at that point was just 27. I had just turned 27. Um, and I mean, when I say I was hypertensive stage two, my blood pressure was like 170 over 110 first thing in the morning. Uh, I was sleeping two or three hours a night and it was just, it, it was just not worth it. So it was kind of on the horizon of, I, I can't keep doing this. I've found something else that I can do. I'll give it a shot. If I can't make it work, then I'm going to pivot and go into consulting or go do something else. And I think uh, a lot of people might not have that spousal belief in them, but for my wife seeing me of, okay, you had this trajectory in your life and in your career of you made it in corporate America came CEO of a hospital of a fortune 200 company. Like you did it. You you proved yourself to me as versus the people that are like, oh, I'm going to start a landscaping business. And then two weeks later, they're like, actually, I'm going to do sub two deals. And then, you know, all this sort of thing. So, uh, man, whenever I quit my job and we put it on the, put it on the market, like a few weeks later, I didn't do anything at all. Um, I kind of just sat around the house and was a bum. And then I, started doing all these creative methods of marketing within the business because I was finally uh, untethered from operating in this regulatory environment. So I was like, screw direct mail, direct mail is dumb. Who even does anything like that? And I started texting and cold calling and voicemail and email, didn't get a deal for three months, sent out another 2000 letters, got another five deals, made another hundred grand. I'm like, what the heck is happening? I need to stick to this. And so I really focused on um, trying to be humble in my approach of Mason, you might have had success in your career and in this other place in your life, but you don't know what you're doing out here. Copy and paste what other people are doing and do it really well and do a lot of it and then iterate from there. And so that's how I built my business, uh, direct mail marketing, uh, doing tons of it and uh, just moving into different markets, getting more creative with the mail, uh, doing some different marketing stuff, some cold calling, some emailing and stuff like that. But the bread and butter is... Uh, direct mail marketing and just sticking to it and trying to keep it as simple as possible. I mean, and I know direct mail marketing, especially from investors has gone a long way. There's, there, there's some buddies of mine that they'll do uh, the fake checks where it looks like a check when you're opening it up and then the color. I mean, it's surprising with the color changing the color, how someone will open up based off of that. And like, I mean, so are there any <coughs> tricks that you've, picked up that you're like, Hey, this is something that's really worked well for me so far. Yeah. I think, uh, steering away a little bit from the pawn shop mentality of differentiating your marketing where everyone is saying we buy land for cash. Of course you buy land for cash. You're not going to be able to get financing on a piece of vacant land. Yeah. Uh, so everyone is buying land for cash. And since there are so many scammers out there, we try to legitimate legitimatize ourselves in different ways of recent marketing material will say, hey, you know, concerned about scams, we will provide uh, proof of funds, we ensure every purchase in this particular area, like call Kelsey at team a title agency in Phoenix and uh, let say it's legitimate and being able to go and verify and have title reps and attorneys in various states saying yep, yep, they're legitimate, they're different. Uh, so having that verbiage on our marketing material, I think is very helpful as well as getting creative. I have two beautiful dogs. I have two beautiful golden retrievers and I have them on tons of my marketing stuff where mm -hmm. people will see golden retrievers and be like, what is this about? And it's like, oh, it's that crappy piece of land I own in Tucson that I bought 20 years ago and, uh, kind of builder focused of, Hey, we're interested in potentially building on your land, even though I might not be, but just making it look a little less scammy and a little more legitimate, I think is very, very effective in the direct to seller, direct mail marketing business. What, I mean, so you, you, you had that first deal where you made six figures, right? Now you're sending out new mailers. Was there a point in time where maybe a deal didn't go right? You lost some money off it. And I guess it'd be harder, I guess, in the land space, but still where you're like, maybe I chose the wrong decision. Um, 
No, I, I still feel confident in in being in the land space. I haven't lost money yet, knock on wood. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, I've gotten very close. I made $141 on one deal. And that was uh, that was a big mess up of mine. It was, once again, a due diligence error. I outsourced due diligence a long time ago because I am too lazy and not detail-oriented enough to call all the people I need to call. Uh, at this point, I have a full-time acquisition manager and virtual assistants and everything like that. But uh, no, I, I think it's a really great space to be in. That being said, I don't think it is a sustainable business model where mm -hmm. the only value that I provide in the land flipping side of my business is purchasing an asset at a discount. And I'm not adding value to it. I'm not necessarily doing anything to it from clearing the land to doing some sense of entitlement or extending utilities or something like that. So I think the long term, there's always going to be a leg of my business that's doing the simple land flipping where I am the pawn shop. Pawn shops exist all over the place for that. But in order to really add value, you need to be either creating more inventory through subdivision or doing some sort of vertical construction, building homes or apartments or something like that. Is that where you plan to take it in the future? Yeah. So I've done some minor subdivision deals and I'm looking at doing more major subdivision deals. Uh, I've got a company that we provide the capital and partner with land investors where uh, myself and Dan Habercost, who uh, I'm sure has also been on your show. Uh, we, we live right down the street from each other. We do business together. We work out together. And uh, so we have a company where we'll joint venture with you. We provide the capital expertise, ensure it's a great deal. And then we do some form of profit split on that. So I think the uh, capital component of land is definitely a space that we're going to be in for a long time because it is such a blue ocean out there of there's not many land lenders and we're not lenders, we're partners. Uh, and there's only a few people doing that. And so I think that's a huge opportunity. And then in general, inventory creation is always going to be an opportunity. They're not making more land. Uh, but if you can take a huge piece of land and split it up into a bunch of small lots, then uh, that's usually a huge value add for what a community might need. So I, I know we talked about it before you got a mic, how I guess the coaching business that you're doing right now is maybe not uh, it's not a hyper focus of what you're doing with the, the land and growth and all that stuff. So where did that come about? So you're doing the, the, the investing in land, right? You're flipping the land. I'm assuming people came up to you like, Hey, Mason, you're making good money. You're teaching your ways. Is that kind of like the path of coaching or what happened there to get into coaching in the first place? Yeah. So it's very, very side hustle, very limited for me. Uh, I don't take on very many people. I've only taken on a handful of people within the coaching space. Uh, we've got a video course like everybody else does. And I will do one on one coaching if people have, you know, a track record and success and that sort of thing. But the way I look at it is uh, it's an opportunity to get paid for my time. I mean, that's why every coach does it. And I, I mean, there's tons of coaches out there that make more in education than they do in the active business that they're coaching on, which is something that uh, I, I don't believe in. Um, I don't have the time to do that much or devote that much energy to it. But uh, with certain coaching clients of mine where I've got this funding company, they you know, pay me a little bit of money. I teach them all the systems and everything. And if you listen to my podcast, The Big Picture Blueprint, I mean, we give everything away for free. It's the kind of person that needs to pay money in order to take significant action. Uh, but now they bring me deals all day. So it's the idea of, okay, now I can teach people how to bring me deals. And it's essentially an expansion of my business of I've got an arm of my business that will fund all these deals. And so I teach them how to look for good deals and find good deals. And now I get to partner with them on the good deals. And so you look at the lifetime value of a customer and you're able to help them create financial freedom or independence or whatever you want to call it for themselves. And then I get to uh, still cash in on deals that they're doing whenever they need additional capital uh, for them. So that's kind of how it happened. And to be honest, I went from 25 employees and being in meetings all the time to being a solo entrepreneur to having one employee. And I missed uh, I missed the coaching and leadership aspect of uh, my corporate job. So you're more particular now, I guess, of the people you bring on. Were you always particular about the people you brought on for the coaching people, or is that a hundred percent? Okay, yeah, I. It's people that have either had a high level of success in the corporate world or a high level of success in the entrepreneur world and want to get involved in the land space, and they um, they're not going to waste their money spending 
time with me, if that makes sense. So I know they're going to actually be doing deals as versus, and I've been to those conferences where people go to conference to conference and have never done a deal. And they just mm -hmm. get off on that idea of spending money on education and that sort of thing and going to these conferences. And uh, for me, there, there's a certain amount of ethics uh, that play into that, that I don't think is appropriate, where I absolutely think people should be compensated for their time, where I'll pay people for an hour of their time just to pick their brain about certain ideas and certain business. And so that's kind of how I approach it on my end. And um, yeah, I mean, the, all the information on how to do a business like this is out there for free. So it's just the type of person that needs to pay money to commit to something. So would you probably uh, assume that most of the people that have done coaching in the past have actually done flips on their own or brought you deals? I mean, it's pretty close to 100% as you can get. I'd say so. I think maybe there's one or two that haven't been able to devote the time and energy into it. Mm -hmm. uh, but just like what I try to overcome is the Pareto principle that we were talking about at the beginning of it, where I mean, I'm in these land investing groups that everyone else is in. And I can see there's 20% of the people in the group that are doing 80% of the work. And then there's a bunch of people that are, they say the things of like, uh, I've had people go to me and they're, they're like, Mason, you know, I, I could use some consulting in my business. I've got a land business. I haven't gotten a deal in a, like six months. And I'm like, okay, well, how much marketing material have you sent in the last six months? It's like, oh, well, I sent you know, about 50 letters six months ago. And, you know, I'm still waiting to hear back. And it's like, dude, come on. Like, it's, <laughs> what, what, what are you expecting here? Go send more mail. And if you send 20,000 mailers over the next six months and don't get anything, then give me a call and we can look at systems and stuff like that. But it's uh, just like with everything, it's trying to c overcome um, where there's going to be people that are wasting time and wasting space and adding value to the group and community that we're attempting to create. Is that usually the the biggest hiccup why people are not successful in the land flipping is they just don't do enough of it? I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I do think so. Where talk a lot about lead measures of, okay, you, you can't be tracking how many deals you have if you're not tracking how much marketing material you're sending out. So I think there's this notion that land flipping or land investing is a really great space to get into because there's a lower barrier to entry. Uh, there's all the books and all the courses of learn how to invest in real estate with no and low money down. You need money. You need money to be able to spend on marketing or you need someone that will spend the money on the marketing and you're the one dialing the phone or doing something. So I think a lot of people that have, you know, five grand to spend on a coaching course and then they don't, that was all of the 5,000 they had saved up as versus sending out 8,000 or 9,000 mailers. Um, I think that's one of the biggest holdups is, uh, people not sending enough marketing material is one. Two is they they just don't understand the product. I hear land coaches all the time talk about, you know, we invest in raw land and they're talking about land that's not raw. An infill lot is not a raw piece of land if there's utilities extended in this shovel ready. So they don't understand the product and they can't verify the comps and understand how to actually underwrite a deal appropriately. And then three, it's the access to capital. There aren't institutional lenders in the space. So say you get a fantastic deal where uh, the land's worth 200 grand. You see all these transactions of it, of land that's the exact same selling for 200,000. You have it under contract at 50, or 50,000. You go to a bank and say, hey, can I get a secured promissory note on this? I've got this land locked up at 25% LTV. And the bank is going to tell you uh, that we can't do that. That's 100% LTV. You're paying 50,000. That's the value of the land. And so uh, people can't go to these banks and get loans. And uh, there's a few people that are doing capital partnerships like like us. And I think if you don't know who they are or don't have access to capital, that's uh, the third main barrier to people failing in this space. Uh, for people that don't know, I mean, uh, LTV, loan to value, just FYI. I, I thought it was funny, though, when you said um, uh, $5,000 taking classes, that's the last. I'm pretty sure there was a video of Grant Cardone <laughs> Talked about if you had five thousand dollars left, let me tell you what you should do. You should take my class for five thousand dollars. I was like, yeah. <laughs> What's the idea of everyone has an incentive with whatever they're doing, yeah. and how is their incentive aligned with you and what you're attempting to do? Where if it, I mean, it it just doesn't make sense, and that that's the whole idea of it. Of that's so cool. Of yeah, spend five thousand dollars, and you're gonna make hundreds of thousands of dollars. And me spending five grand on that course did make me lots and lots of money. Uh, but 
if I'd spent $5,000 on that course and then it's like, hey, you need to be sending five to 10,000 pieces of mail and you need to buy all these systems and all these other things. And I looked and my checking account was zero. Um, what the heck am I going to do now? Of Okay, well, now I've got this strategy and I have no way to implement it. Uh, thank you, Mason, for being here today. So if people are listening and they're looking to find your podcast, more information about land flipping, or maybe they have a deal locked up and <clears throat> what he's talking about too, for people that are, are very novice to this. And of course you can find all this stuff, right? Is locking up a property and you can wholesale a property. There's an assignment on most of these deals right there, at least in, in California, I'm assuming in most places, right? So you have the property locked up and you wholesale it over to, I mean, maybe even, uh, Mason over here, but where can, where can they find more information about all this stuff, if, Mason? Yeah, absolutely. So LinkedIn is the best way to get a hold of me. Mason McDonald, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I've got a podcast uh, that Dan Habercost and I host together. We've got fantastic guests on there all the time. And we talk a lot about land flipping in our own businesses. That's called the Big Picture Blueprint. So if you go to YouTube, Spotify, anywhere, the Big Picture Blueprint. And then if you are a land flipper, land investor, and you need capital to do a deal, uh, my company, Ground Up Partners, we will fund it and assist you with the due diligence uh, to make sure it's a good deal and do a joint venture. You can submit any deals to gupland.com, G-U-P-land.com. So I'll finish off one last question. And, and for everyone here, please thank you for um, for listening. And please go on the show notes to find Mason and, and subscribe to uh, Road to Growth. Um, where do you see land flipping going in the future with technology? I mean, I'm guessing, I don't know if there's a particular with artificial intelligence or something else that will change the game, but do you see like drastic changes to the game? I think so. I think, uh, and I, I won't go down the rabbit hole too long. I think one of the, one of the biggest holdups in the actual transaction piece is, I, it's always title issues and probate issues. I think there's a future in the long term of the blockchain solving a lot of title issues and um, uh, title companies being able to not, I mean, I, I had to go sign in person for all these warranty deeds and everything like that. And there's all sorts of title commitments and title searches that are happening that are costing tons and tons of money. And so I think eventually the blockchain will help with that, uh, which will resolve so many probate issues and everything associated with the transfer of property from one person to another and legitimacy. Uh, that's probably 20, 30 years down the road, at least in, in my mind. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's always going to be more competition as AI gets more prevalent. Uh, there's, I use AI in my, my business every day of ask Google Bard or ChatGPT to create uh, a land investing business plan that can be implemented and use all these tools and systems and software uh, at a discount. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more capabilities AI has, the more competition that is going to be created. So it's figuring out for those of us that have had success in it, how to implement and how to adapt and how to use it within our own businesses to continue to grow. It, it is so funny when we talk about ChatGPT that like the limit of what it can give us is the limit of where you can think of questions. Like people tell me, go, you got to think of this question to ask. And I go, oh my gosh, I never thought of that question. So that one right there, putting that blueprint together for the business plan using this technology is again, another brilliant way of doing it. Oh yeah. Well, and like one, one more thing on it where uh, I had to do a deed in lieu of foreclosure on a seller finance deal that the, the person stopped paying. They didn't want me to foreclose. So we did deed in lieu of foreclosure and my title company said, Hey, there's not an estoppel form with it. And so I, rather than go to my attorney, I went to chat GPT or Google Bard or Google Gemini is what I use mostly. And I was like, Hey, can you create an estoppel form in Colorado for me? And they said, no, get an attorney to do it. I said, okay, well, can you create a template of the form that I can send to my attorney to uh, help them with it? And they were like, absolutely, here you go. Here's the whole form for you. <laughs> and so I'm able to send that to my attorney and uh, you know, save, save on my billable hours and everything like that for them to verify. And I'm not giving legal advice or <laughs> any sort yeah. of advice. Don't use ChatGPT or Google Bard or whatever for uh, legal, but you're absolutely right. Of If you can reframe and reiterate and re-ask the question in different ways, man, it's it's very limited what it can't do for you. Well, thank you again, Mason, for, for being here. Hopefully everyone uh, got some some great information. I mean, I've had, a, again, a lot of different entrepreneurs on the platform. I mean, I've had low barrier of entry businesses on here. We we're selling uh, containers and just random things. I mean, land, I mean, seems like that kind of balancing act, if you have something solid, but also it's a low barrier of entry, it's, I mean, go, go on the show notes, go find Mason, listen to the podcast, 
And there's a lot of class out there, like you said. Please subscribe, please share, and uh, go find Mason. Bye, everyone. Thank you.